Hello, everyone. I'm Carl Ulrich, and I'm Vice Dean of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Wharton, and I also oversee the Wharton San Francisco campus. It's so great to see you all. This is the eighth, eighth session of Wharton Scale School, and it's, it's brought jointly to you by Penn Wharton Entrepreneurship and by External Affairs, our alumni organization's lifelong learning. <laughs> program. I was thrilled in, in talking to some of you before the session to learn that many of you have been to almost all of those, and most of you have been to several of these. So it's really terrific to see you come back. The idea behind lifelong learning is pretty simple. We realized at Wharton that there were a lot of resources for helping startups get, get going, but relatively fewer resources for helping them scale their businesses. And by scale, we mean really talking about factors of 10 growth, whether it's from 2 million to 20 million in revenue, from 20 million to 200 million, or from 200 million to 2 billion, those kinds of scaling challenges. And we realized two things. One was there was a gap in the marketplace, and the second was that Wharton really had some unique, unique expertise to offer. And so we decided to really pilot this idea with a series of alumni events, of which this is the eighth, focused on specific issues that companies face in, in scaling their businesses. I want to recognize Irina Yen, who's here. Irina, wave. Uh, uh, Irina has, has led our Scale School initiative and really organized uh, the event and, and has done a, a terrific job at that. Uh, I want to introduce our, our moderator this evening, who is uh, Mike Yusin. Mike is the William and Jacqueline Egan Professor of Management. He also directs the Center for Leadership and Change Management at the Wharton School, which comprises more than 30 individual programs. Uh, Mike started out as a sociologist and eventually migrated into being a real leader in all things related to leadership, and we're super thrilled to have had him as part of the Wharton faculty for, for, for a long time. Uh, I have known Mike for a long time, but I think the first time I interacted with Mike was it could have been in the 1990s when we were both new, relatively new at Wharton, when I got an invitation uh, to go with him to Mount Everest. And I, uh, I declined that <laughs> opportunity. <laughs> but it gives you some sense of Mike's zest for life and his approach to, uh, to leadership and management. So let's welcome Mike Yusin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Carl, we're still saving you a spot, so <laughs> keep your uh, ice axe dry or whatever the term would be. Great to see you all here tonight, uh, a midweek night, uh, a school night, so I appreciate your being here, uh, appreciate your support for the school. Really important for faculty like myself to uh, engage with you, to uh, appreciate uh, what you're doing uh, in the years since you've been with us, so we get a lot of feedback, so thank you for being here and providing that kind of feedback. Uh, we're going to... Uh, really go back to uh, Benjamin Franklin to get us going tonight in, in the following regard. Benjamin Franklin, we should know this, is our founding father, our founding parent. 1741, in fact, before he signed the Declaration of Independence. In fact, Benjamin Franklin is an amazing uh, document signer. Signed the Declaration of Independence. One of the few people to not only sign that, he also signed to sign that and to sign the Treaty of Paris at 1783 the end of the revolution uh, on uh, American terms, and then he signed the Constitution. Before all that, though, he created the University of Pennsylvania, and in doing so, he said, I'd like to create a university on the premise that we need great academic knowledge. Uh, knowledge. It should come, though, in a form that is practically useful, practically applicable. So we've got that uh, DNA in us uh, as faculty. And then Joe Wharton came along in 1881, quite a bit later, and uh, he offered uh, his endowing gift, his naming gift to our school. We do claim to be, and I think it may be right, Carl, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we are probably the oldest business school, but maybe there's some competitors on that. Joseph Wharton, though, in giving the gift to us, pick it up in Benjamin Franklin's heritage, said, with my, uh, <laughs> my naming gift here, I'd like the Wharton School to follow the Benjamin Franklin tradition, academic knowledge of practical value, focused on solving the problems of civilization. So that's our modest uh, charter, so to speak. Uh, and with that said, we're going to take a few minutes now here to think about the problems of civilization. 
through the lens of looking at leadership and culture. And by the way, one more st statement about our, our kind of peculiar history. If you came out of our school prior to about 1995, you had a great education, but you probably did not get a course that had leadership in the title. But for the last 20 years now, or 25 years really, the school has committed at the graduate level, at the undergraduate level, and the mid-career level uh, to put, putting leadership in the curriculum on the premise that understanding human behavior, being able to take a strategy and execute around it does require a lot of thinking through, some good research to support it. And uh, thus, for the last 25 years, uh, Carl, myself, and a bunch of other people have been building up a, a curriculum, if you will, that uh, brings people now in our programs into thinking not only about strategy and finance and accounting and marketing and operations, but how to put all those strands together especially if you're moving from small to less than small. That's our topic, is how to <clears throat> scale tonight with the particular focus of leadership and culture. Now, many other things go into it. I know you're all into it, uh, certainly far more than I am. So add to our commentary as we get going here. But let me offer a couple thoughts on leadership and then culture. And then we have uh, two guests tonight who are going to work with us in an active uh, dialogue, kind of a fireside dialogue, on the power of leadership to make a difference, and especially our topic now, a special focus, culture. So just thinking about the leadership piece then the culture piece, let's see. Does leadership make a difference? Does the individual have that much impact on the world? Lots of intuition says, well, we can think of examples of people that had an enormous impact as one person, as they created a company, maybe took a company and redirected a firm, can one person make a difference? Lots of academic evidence says yes, of course. There's also great evidence, though, that says repeatedly and recurrently, one person can uh, leverage, can have much more impact if they are working with uh, an inner circle, with, with a team of people that they respect, that they depend upon, that provide complementary skills, are diverse in, in instincts and risk tolerance and all of that. And then, kind of the next question, this is just warm up, is to think about the, the, the defining elements, the capacities that you know you want, you need, you see, and people that you work with, and now in your own exercise of leadership you apply every day, such as thinking strategically. Or to put that in the negative, you don't want to work for somebody who cannot think strategically. But of course, that's not enough. You want somebody who can also communicate persuasively. And by the way, some of you might have gone nuts at some point, maybe early in your career, when you're working with somebody who just can't get paper or these days text off their desk. So something about deciding decisively. So we pushed that along pretty quickly. We're, we're into maybe eight or 10 really important features or facets of of who you are, thinking strategically, communicating persuasively, deciding decisively, and by the way, honoring the room, that's part of the, the package, making certain everybody there appreciates that you appreciate them. And kind of close in, we know from research, we know from uh, in, intuition really, or just experience, put it uh, simply that way, that all those factors are vital, kind of close in, in sort of the microcosm of everyday life. But when that microcosm is no longer, in a sense, achievable as you go from 10 to 20 or 50 or 100 people working for you, or to pick an example many of you know of, because my guess is a couple of people in this room have worked for eBay along the way. When Meg Whitman took over, I think it was 1995, by my recollection, there were 28 employees at eBay. She knew them all, to say the obvious. And by the time she left, she had 10,000. Or take John Chambers. We just interviewed John. He's got a great new book out, Connecting the Dots. I recommend it. We just interviewed John at length. And he makes the point that uh, his, in his, some of you probably are, are Cisco veterans as well, in his uh, time at Cisco, he went from, God, I think I got the numbers here, he went from 400 employees when he came in back in 1991 to when he exited, over 35,000 people are working there. 
He knows a lot of them. And for those of you who've known John Chambers, he's just a, a great uh, person to be with. He knows people. He's very personal. But at 35,000, uh, all those close in leadership capacities of being a decisive decision maker and a persuasive communicator, uh, somehow we have to build out beyond that, that sort of the, the, the microcosm of everyday life when we can no longer talk with directly or we don't, don't even know many of the people there. That brings then uh, back to Benjamin Franklin and Joseph Wharton brings in a lot of academic thinking of great practical importance, in my view, about the importance, not our topic tonight, or the power of architecture, how you organize people, how you pay them by teams or by division or functions, or how you create uh, different uh, subcategories within the firm. Call that architecture. And then another great tool, vital if you go beyond a couple dozen people, and that is the mindset that we carry around without quite really realizing it's there. Culture tends to be the big word for that. I'm gonna offer up a couple academic thoughts on the topic, and then we're gonna do a deep dive into it. In offering up the thought, though, I do have to have us uh, take on a slight, very brief exercise here on the premise that we, <laughs> in leadership, that's our underlying topic here, in leadership, we need to know the ideas. We also have to be able to articulate the ideas and use the ideas. And for that, don't move yet. I'm going to have you all stand up. I want you to do a 360. I want you to meet everybody who's near you. Don't move yet. Who's within about four feet of you. And then as we conclude by 830, uh, we're going to sum up. And I also want you to take a minute or two with your neighbors, now that you know them, uh, in fact, especially get to meet people you haven't met before, uh, and tell them, if you wouldn't mind, what you're going to hang on to from this evening's dialogue. So anyway, that's a long-winded way of saying, would you please stand up, and would you get acquainted with your neighbors? Hey, I'm Jane. Nice to meet you, too. taking calls and it's loud in a coffee shop. Like a, like a, uh, like that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So are you from San Francisco? Or? Oh, cool. Nice. When did you move out? Okay, so you've been here for a while. All right, everybody. Very cool. Not, have you always been with Penn? or? Oh. Very cool. How recently did you... Okay. Yeah. All right, everybody, grab a chair. We're yeah. going to get going. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, it's good to know. I don't know why I didn't think of coming here for space. That's yeah, yeah. No, that's great. Okay. All right, everybody, Hi, grab a chair. Yeah. We're going to get going. Oh, 
on three. We're gonna, we're gonna, you know, one, two, three. Yeah, All right, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, we should catch up. It's so good to see you. LA. So, I only you're teach here, leadership. You're here. Let's see you here. All right. Excellent. Thank you for uh, getting so quickly acquainted. Here are a couple academic thoughts. Got them in front of us. <laughs> there they are. Uh, academic sociologists will help us appreciate obvious statements here that uh, we need to think about values, like what we hold to be almost self-evident, uh, the, the truth of who we are and where we're going. And then norms, just to pick, pick up on that particular term, something about the guidelines on how we behave. For example, there's a norm in the US, I've always loved this one, when somebody says, how's your day going? The norm is you offer a one answer response, fine. Don't go beyond that. <laughs> the norm is they don't want to hear about your day, but they, of course, that, that's a norm. So values and norms, kind of an obvious statement there. And then uh, a lot of people, I've got Ed Shine, who used to be on the faculty at the Sloan School at MIT, uh, will elaborate at great length uh, how norms are created, how values are uh, put in place. And they warn, and this is uh, implicit in this paragraph at the bottom of the page, that once we get the norm set, the values created, think of, think of some of the world's religions that go back a couple thousand years, once those ideas are there, they just carry on like a, like a ner by inertial guidance, like a flywheel. They are there, they're reproduced, they're sustained. And thus, while they can take people in directions that make sense, they also can become an enormous source of resistance to change. One of the great enemies of <laughs> digital disruption right now is the, uh, um, are the values and the norms that are out there, the mindsets, the cultures that are offering uh, the old way of doing business in an era where that maybe is no longer going to be so easy to achieve. Culture is a great source of guidance, but also a great source of resistance. Howard Schultz makes a great point. There's one more uh, particular here to throw in. The term I'm going to have you look at is in the second line. He says something about an emotional tie. And I can't overstate how important it is as we think about values and norms and their creation uh, to draw upon people's deeper feelings. It's a head game but also a heart game, emotions and beyond. And some, uh, a couple other people, lots of writing on this from academics, have uh, worried a lot about how do, how do we create a culture? Where, where do they come from where, where, <laughs> besides heaven? And if you look at the middle paragraph, there are sources of organizational culture. Well, it's not exactly a typology, but it's um, a suggestion here that there are a range of avenues by which cultures are created. Once they're created, you're kind of stuck with them for quite a while. That's probably a good thing in most cases, but not always. In the case of Toyota, to illustrate the point, though, about the diverse sources of the culture now we take as sacrosanct or important or values we adhere to, uh, Toyota, I think you know the story. Carl actually knows the story very well. Back in 1949, 50-51, Toyota digging out of post-war Japan very little capital to <laughs> put together a production plant, uh, decided out of necessity to focus on learning what they're doing by doing it and every day becoming better at it. So continuous improvement, that's where that came from. Did not come from heaven, didn't come from some <laughs> academic consultant, it came out of solving a very practical problem. And all buffers are waste. We take that as one of the great methods or the great features of the Toyota way. That came out of the fact that there was no capital to create buffers or to have a big supply of carburetors there. Uh, couldn't allow capital to be tied up. In any case, though, those ideas, that's the origin. But once there, those ideas have carried on now for 80 years. Uh, next two, just by way of examples, maybe uh, more specific to this region, uh, founders in their own often inadvertent way, almost a projection of who they are, their style, what they hold dear, uh, can, can create, and this is I think a little bit true at Charles Schwab, some of you probably have had time at Schwab, uh, or back at eBay in its earlier days, and uh, the founders' values, the owners' values, the top management team's values in the early days 
often create a, a mindset which then rolls on. And then here's a statement on that. Once it's there, uh, it is self-sustaining and really hard to re-engineer along the way, which puts a premium on the early stages of a, of a startup of getting those ideas that make sense into the sort of just into the water we swim in because they will, as they take hold, uh, often be a source of great uh, sustaining momentum and they'll be resistant to change. Once those ideas are there, that's the last paragraph, uh, and you've all been involved in this, we're gonna hire people here who kind of fit our way of life, our method. So locally for us, Vanguard, $5 trillion under management these days, Vanguard has a, a method of asset management, well-known, very low cost, very customer focused, all that sort of thing. Indexing is part of the way of life there as well. And thus, the first line, a, a reference of microfinance group there, but uh, Vanguard is also a good example. Employees are hired who share Vanguard values. Van, Vanguard explicitly vets for that. Do you believe in what we believe in? If so, then uh, we'll get you to the second round of interviewing. Women's World Banking, a microfinance group I've worked with for a long time, uh, they have a calling to serve underserved women in the developing world who cannot get ac proper full access to financial services. When they hire, they explicitly want people who are committed to that agenda. Makes obvious sense, it's almost a truism. Uh, let's see, every time you turn around, this is a statement really about your management, your leadership. It is amazing. Every time you turn around, people are looking at you for the code that you have just um, provided them on what's valued or what is important. Uh, in a managerial or a leadership role, above all, you're always on stage, you're never off stage. And you know this, it's almost a truism here too, that people in uh, positions of responsibility become very careful about how they, how they dress, how they stand, who they meet with, in that every act of that kind is exhibiting the values or the contrary. Stories and ceremonies, uh, it can, this can seem unbusinesslike, but again, cannot overemphasize the power of storytelling and ceremony. I'm gonna illustrate uh, the power of ceremony with a um, personal experience. I think we all at least know the phrase, the Medal of Honor. So it's America's highest military honored, uh, highest tradition of honor. And I managed to get into a White House uh, ceremony honoring posthumously a recipient of the Medal of Honor who had died many years ago. Often the Medal of Honor takes many years to get through all the levels of review. Uh, we're in the east wing of the White House, and it's a, there's a very large room, very famous room, where many receptions are held. Uh, the room is packed with maybe 250 people, many of the soldiers who fought with this particular soldier who uh, was killed in action were there. Uh, media was there, Barack and Michelle Obama were there, and as the, as the what they call the citation is read, why this individual is now being granted posthumously the Medal of Honor. There are only about 75 living recipients as we stand here today, 3,400 historically. Uh, as that citation is read, you could have heard a pin drop in a room with at least 250 people, a solemn ceremony. We all appreciate how important that is or think what happened in the rotunda over the, uh, the Capitol the last couple of days. Ceremonies, in that sense, are picking up on the values that we hold dear and are reinforcing, sustaining the values that, that are important. You've all seen that, not quite a Medal of Honor event, of course, but you've all seen that in the places that you work. And the, the last um, thought I'm gonna have here, uh, I'm gonna pick on Charles Elachi here. Anybody here work with Charles Elachi who used to run JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab? Uh, Charles Elachi, an engineer, a physicist, ran JPL for quite some time. I think you know the deal. If you're JPL, anything that goes into space without people on board, they have the federal contract, part of Caltech, to do the engineering and the delivery. And Charles Elachi became um, enamored of an experience he had 
He actually told the story actually uh, here in Wharton West a couple years ago on several other occasions. Loves to tell the story of two engineers who were the uh, managing engineers for two missions to Venus. And as the missions both arrived, uh, two separate missions, uh, they both malfunctioned, cost of each mission around $400 million. The two engineers, two managing engineers came in to see uh, the boss after the uh, terrible failure, human error was uh, the cause, to resign. And uh, Charles Ilachi said, well, did you learn anything? And of course, they learned a lot. And he said, well, in that case, uh, you cannot resign. I'm certainly not going to fire you because I've just spent $400 million to educate you on that particular source of errors that you're not going to make again. And he tells the story, he said, because it's an engineering culture where there's sometimes too little tolerance for error and mistakes. And he wanted to build a culture that um, provided more acceptability of getting out to the edge, making mistakes, pulling back from that edge. So it's a way of saying, now by way of quick summary, uh, let's see, cultures, if we're going from 25 to 500, if we're scaling, and the architecture as well, increasingly vital. It's really a fundamental feature of scaling beyond uh, a smaller circle that you may have begun with. With that said, I've got a couple thoughts up there on how we build it, where it comes from, and how to re-engineer it. And now I have the privilege of bringing on to the stage, if they will uh, walk up here with me, and here they are. Uh, Joseph uh, Ancinelli, who is uh, just coming forward, a uh, partner at Greylock. Many of you have worked with Greylock. And at the same time, he's a serial entrepreneur. So Joseph, <laughs> great to have you here. <laughs> and Jane, as I've indicated there, uh, Wharton MBA, 17, uh, was a leadership venture fellow in Antarctica, by the way. Uh, she worked at McKinsey, but now she's got her own startup, Harper. You pronounce it wild or wild? Wild. Wild, great. Anyway, great to have you here. Uh, we're going to have just a dialogue. We're going to, yeah, thank you, thank you. And I should say, correct myself, I was correct. We're going to end at 8 o'clock, in case you're thinking about uh, <laughs> the, the exit. So, um, Joe, so I'm going to start with you and then over to Jane. Uh, just uh, picking up on whatever thread kind of caught your, your attention on the power of culture to make a difference when individuals can no longer have uh, a handshake to make a difference. Where do you see it? How does it happen? What's your experience with it? I mean, uh, I think culture is one of the most important parts of actually a, a startup um, because it defines the way people work. There's the work you have to do, and then there's how you do it. And so for, for me, and whether it's Greylock as an investor or running a company, we're always looking at people around sort of two avenues, which is what I would call their technical competency, like can they do a job? But just as important is this idea called relational competency, which is this phrase from this book, The Southwest Way, about yep. Southwest Airlines, where you have to build a team that has the right relational competency. Um, you know, if you hire a bunch of quote unquote rock stars, but they don't get along, you know, Guns N' Roses was only good for two albums. You know what I mean? Like they just, they didn't, they didn't stick together. You know, they were, they were great, but you really want to find people that have that sort of sustaining uh, teamwork that to, to make it for the long haul. Super. Jane, how about it on your part? Yeah, I think, um, I think I've recognized in the last year and a half how, um, how much I, understood culture theoretically and building it and in companies recognized the importance of it and knew what I thought would be a great culture but never understood the true challenges of building one. Um, and we've gone through, and, and when you have such a small team, you know, every person represents such a huge portion of it. Um, so we've, we've kind of gone through the trouble of like, we're going to be a cool culture, or like, we're going to like, it's going to be great, everyone's going to have fun. And like, you just can't force culture. Um, and so we had to like kind of understand how you build it organically, or at least what seems organic. Um, and I think it, it comes from first understanding and stating what your values are as a company, um, hiring against those values, firing quickly when they don't meet those values, and then trying to find a way to 
organically build it within a team that hopefully gels. Um, but that's really hard to achieve sometimes. So let me pick up on the, uh, the dark side, if you will. So culture, it, just, it sort of carries us forward without quite realizing it's there. It's a great asset. You don't have to tell people what to do. They're going to do it. Having said that, uh, some days you want them to do something differently, and they're saying that's not consistent with our values. So just pick up on the, uh, the question of the extent to which culture also has that kind of dark side to it. Joseph. Oh. Yeah, I mean, th there's a lot of examples where, you know, what worked for a company for a long time stops working. Um, and, uh, and I'll give, a, you know, a sort of a contrast example. So Steve Ballmer at Microsoft, you know, classic example where Microsoft was this hugely dominant company. And there's this really funny, you find on YouTube video when the iPhone first came out, and he laughed about it. You know, he was like, $500 phone, no one's ever going to buy that. It doesn't have a keyboard. It's never going to work in business. And the, the challenge was he sort of had this somewhat fixed mindset, he, and he wasn't able to see past what his view, world view was. And you know, culturally, that, 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 that was a big challenge for him. He had this very fixed mindset, which was like, here's how Microsoft has always done things. We own the, the operating system platform. He never really saw it as a threat. And I'll contra contrast that with Satya. So we did an event recently at Greylock with Satya, and I was leading a roundtable with him, and I, and I said, hey, so, you know, and, I, and I'm really proud of what he's done at Microsoft. And I said, you know, Satya, what was the biggest thing when you became CEO at Microsoft you had to do? And he said, without a pause, he said, I had to change the culture of the company. And I said, in what way? And he talked about um, this, this book um, by Carol Dweck, who you, I'm sure, know, where it's this whole idea about growth mindset and the importance of actually understanding challenges and failures are really important. And he said, I have spent all of my time around cultural change inside of Microsoft to get people to think differently. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the results are starting to show. I mean, it, that cultural change is having a huge impact. Great, Microsoft. Jane, I'm going to take that question over to you. Um, you're at a, <laughs> a rapidly growing stage. How, how have you created a growth mindset? A growth mindset? Um... It, it's like person by person um, at our stage right now. Um, so we, I mean, the values was a big part of what we recognized from the start was important. Actually, from a case study we did in school, we were like just starting to go away from what we wrote our business school essays about and be like, okay, should we do this bra thing? And that was like really far from what we thought we were going to, it was like public policy to bras. It was like, oh, going to be a big change. And we were like, should we do this? Let's take this entrepreneurship class. And then in the class, my like now co-founder and I, and you know, we're like sitting next to each other and the entrepreneurship professor is like, 99% of startups fail because of co-founder issues. And we're like, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like this case study on Wozniak and Jobs and why they didn't work out. And it wasn't because their vision for Apple and what it was going to be was different, totally aligned. It wasn't because of how they thought they could get there was misaligned, totally aligned. It was their core, like personal as humans values at the end of the day. So, you know, we walked out of the room and we're like, should we talk about our values? Um, <laughs> and like that's, I think that as much as you change culture, whatever it might be, that has to stay true. And that's translated into brand values that, that manifest to like customers in different ways. Um, and it also is our cultural values. The growth mindset piece, I mean, I mean, even, you know, the people I've managed, the people who haven't worked out, um, like I, one, I manage two people right now, and one sits on one side of me and one the other. And they both have different, like, they're at different stages of developing growth mindsets. So I, I literally, like, one will say one thing, and I have to, like, be like, right, she's, you know, I have to, like, w talk her through this bit and, like, actually, like, impart to her why a growth mindset is actually beneficial and, like, how she can grow into that and the other is like a little bit further along. So for us, we're still in a stage where it's like person by person. We're not quite big enough where it's uh, like an apprenticeship model um, that's passed down from like layer to layer. We're just, they're right all there. So just to, to stay on that, uh, we've got a couple more questions and we're gonna definitely open this up. I referenced along the way, uh, kind of an obvious point. Once you know what your culture is, you can put some words on it, you kind of intuitively feel it as well you then begin to conjure up the kinds of questions you might ask a candidate when they come in for the first or second interview to see if there's going to be a decent fit. So Jane, maybe beginning with you, how do you figure out if somebody's got the culture to fit your sense of where the organization ought to go? 
Yeah, so we force them to talk about a time that, that something didn't, that they failed at something or they didn't work well. And I know it sounds really cliche, like, tell me about a time when you failed at, you know, whatever. Um, but the way, I forget how we have it exactly in our guide, in our interview guide, but it's in a way where you can kind of better understand how they deal with conflict and if they're humble, if they learn from mistakes, um, or if it's like a full blame situation where they're like, it was totally someone else's fault, and you're like, mm -hmm, red flag, okay. Um, and I mean, we do a lot of, a lot before then, like they go through projects where we have to see their work product. If they make a mistake in the work product, that's actually what we've found to be a really helpful scenario. We actually, even if they don't make a mistake, when they present it to us, we decide one of us is going to push back on one of um, something that, that they've done or said is true, even if it is true and correct, and see how they react to it. Um, so giving a little bit less room for, for them to tell us what their flaws are and to try to see it manifest. That being said, I, I think it's nearly, I don't, I don't know that you can 100% filter, but within the first week, you can tell if it's you know, a fit yeah. or not. Joseph, how about you? So I'm going to give away my question. So if anyone ever interviews with me, you'll know this. <laughs> so <laughs> write these down, right. everybody. So I, one of the things, you know, by the way, failure and getting to getting people that are comfortable with failure, I think, is actually really important yeah, for okay. early stage we'll companies. And so we ask a lot of questions about that. Hmm. But getting back to this growth mindset, um, I ask this question where I say, "Tell me about a company that you admire that's number one in their game, and what makes them so great." And people are like, oh, this seems like a total like, layup. This is like an easy question. And you know, people are sort of opining about the iPhone or something like that. And, and I tell, well, what else makes them great? And what else makes them great? And literally, I let them go on for like five or 10 minutes. And then I said, great. I'm Satya, and I ask you, how are we going to go compete with the iPhone? I'm giving you $200 million to do it. What would you do? And people are like, Shoot. <laughs> like, and, and I'm like, I'm like, look, I don't know what the answer is, and I'm not sure if you know what you do to figure it out, but it gives them this opportunity to start to think about like this like hard challenge and to start to think through like, okay, how can I actually do that? Right? Because you for us in, in terms of in a startup, like you're you're trying to do the impossible oftentimes. You're going up against these massive companies that um, you know, it's kind of crazy to think, hey, I want to create a competitor to Salesforce. So, like, that's what we're trying to do at Cloudly. And like, people look at me like, that's insane. I'm like, it's not, because you know what? They did that 20 years ago, so we're going to go do it back to them. So getting to that question and getting people to think really big about sort of maybe what's something that might sound impossible, again, I don't know if they're going to get the right answer, and I don't know if they could necessarily compete with iPhone, but getting people to really think through that and brainstorm about that is a really good indicator of, can they get their head wrapped around or not? You know, to add my own thinking on that, uh, a Wharton graduate of a few years ago now runs Johnson & Johnson, J&J, &J, uh, Alex Gorski. Uh, and he's been on our campus in Philadelphia many, many times. And he's often referenced for him kind of the killer question, uh, not in that negative sense, but the, but the decisive question when he's hiring at the very senior level. So he gets to talk to the finalist because he's way up there, he's CEO. And he said, the question seems to work best for him because Johnson & Johnson has a culture that puts a huge premium on independent leadership of separate operating companies. So there's corporate, but they got 125 relatively separate P&L operating companies. Leadership in every one vital. It's a leadership story there in part. So for him, the key question is when somebody is coming in an inside candidate, would you please name four people at Johnson & Johnson whose leadership you have significantly developed, detail it, and how is it being applied now? Or to take one more example, you probably both, or at least Joseph, but maybe Jane too, have worked with uh, Peter Thiel. And I've always heard what one of Peter's questions is, uh, some of you probably have been through this, uh, tell me something that most people think is true that is untrue. He wants to be a bit the contrarian, as, as we know. You probably work with him. so. All right, uh, let me move on to uh, a different way of thinking. I'm actually going to sit down at this moment. Uh, Jane, beginning with you, as you look ahead, the culture that's going to serve you in the early stages may not be quite the right culture for a later stage. So give us your thinking about maybe thinking longer term. What do you want to build in such that when you are the big player, one day you will be, uh, the culture that will serve that is also now almost anticipated in what you're doing now. How do you, how do you think about the longer term? Um, 
I mean, a part of it is what is it, and then a part is how does it transcend as you scale effectively, and then I guess a third piece would be how does it change when you scale. Um, so, I mean, for us, it's really important right now, this is probably pretty obvious, that the people we get in the beginning are the right fits that, that really embrace and internalize the culture and the values that we believe in and that we want in the company because that's going to set the pace. And we've seen it, I think the best way we learned it was when um, we had a bad hire that really affected the culture negatively. Um, and we could see how quickly one person could taint the group and that's, that's just not possible. We can't let that happen at, yeah. a, at an early stage like this. So I think number one is like getting it right today with the right people and making sure that, that we set that right culture. And there are some aspects to it that are really important to us today that, that I don't, frankly, I don't know what will be important later, but like agility um, and humility are absolutely critical right now. Um, like things change monthly, absolutely like monthly, hourly it's probably more <laughs> accurate on, on what's, what's a priority even. Um, you know, we set quarterly goals, we have business metrics, we have individual metrics, um, you know, we're like trying to be all buttoned up and whatever and like that, it just goes to shit. And so having to be, like being able to be agile and, and resilient, you know, like pop back up when, when something has changed is really important. And humility to the point on failure I mean, we don't have any room for egos. Um, not only because I don't, the two of us just like, that's, that wouldn't be our style and it wouldn't be fun, but I mean, you just, we're failing left and right and we want to be. We want to be trying things that are out there and moving quickly to be able to, to learn from them very quickly, to your point before. Um, hopefully they're not $400 million mistakes, but well, they couldn't be, we don't have that money, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and so I, I imagine things will get, I don't know. I mean, you probably know better. Uh, you definitely know better than me, but what they would be later. But, you know, maybe it'll still be agility, but defined a bit differently. I'm sure humility, I can't imagine um, leaving that better resilience. But um, I right. imagine yep. we'll be a bit more stable, I hope. Yeah. Joseph. Uh, I mean, I think that the question of, like, how culture needs to change as company scales is actually very situational. I don't actually think that it's, like, oh, it always changes, or it has to change, or it will never change. It's actually very situational. And I'll, I'll give an example. So at LinkedIn, when Reed started the company, like, he was definitely much more of like a hacker kind of guy. Like, you know, he, and his book that just came out, Blitz Scaling, he's all about, it's just about speed. You gotta get to scale really quickly. And, you know, he got the network up to, you know, millions of folks on LinkedIn. But then the company got to a point where it's like, okay, we need someone else. And that's when Jeff joined and became CEO. And Jeff's very different. Like Jeff is, if anyone's ever seen Jeff speak, and uh, he's just much more polished and buttoned up. And for them, that was the right change that had to happen. Now, they, they kept a lot of the things around speed and agility, but you know they couldn't do some of the hacks, I'll call it, that they did in the early days of the company. Like that just had to, that mindset had to change. I, I'll compare that to Workday. So, um, uh, Anil, my partner at Greylock, started Workday in, the, in our office about 12 years ago, 13 years ago now. And those core cultural values, I mean, he you know, was co-CEO with Dave Duffield for a long time now. He's the CEO um, individually. Like, they actually have maintained them because you know, they, they were setting out on a, on a certain trajectory of building an enterprise software company, and it, and, it, and, it, and it did, in their case, scale. I think the thing that's interesting that we see the most is that there's a point where the cultural values you had do change and you don't even recognize it, that's actually the biggest problem that we tend to see, where um, you're sort of going along and you have all these great cultural values around humility and embracing failure, and then all of a sudden, like, you're no longer humble and, you know, like, like you can't fail. And then you have stuff like what happened at Microsoft where, you know, um, they sort of miss out on massive markets. And, it, it, you know, if you look at Gates in the early days of Microsoft, like, he was wickedly paranoid about everybody and everything and you know, back in you know, ten, you know, whatever, five, 10 years ago when the iPhone came out, they didn't have that same paranoia because they were like, hey, we're on top of the game, like Windows is everywhere, we've won. And if they kept those cultural values of that paranoid, like don't trust anybody, you know, everyone's gonna be our competitor, they might have been in a different, different place today as a company. I mean, it leads to a great question, and let's begin with you, Joseph, on, on sustaining a culture or maybe changing a culture, talk about the tools, the instruments 
Oh, it's actually super hard, actually. I think it's actually um, changing a culture of a company is probably one of the hardest things that you can go through. I mean, it is, it is gut-wrenching. Um, you know, my background, I started my first company when I was uh, at, at Penn, actually. I was a Wharton undergrad. And uh, we got bought by Apple. We were, they were a small little company at the time. And I worked at Apple right before Steve came back. And I, I remember being there. And it, I mean, the place was a mess. I mean, it, I don't know how to say it. I mean, literally, the stories about being nearly bankrupt for that company are totally true. I mean, I was a 24-year-old kid. And I was taking a trip to Japan to go meet with a supplier. And Joe Graziano, the CFO of this big company, literally emailed me personally and asked me why I was taking a trip that I could have saved $200 on the ticket. I mean, the company was really, really bad shape. And, and, and when Steve came back, and I know a ton of people that are still there and have talked about it, like, the, like he, really, he basically had to break the company. And people don't quite realize that. I mean, it was totally on the brink. And well, it was because they faced this really, I mean, they had this you know, threat of dying right in front of them that he was actually able to do it. But that is like super, super hard to do. And oftentimes what it requires is you got to just make a ton of people changes. Like a lot of people got to go and a lot of new people have to come in. You kind of have to just hit reset. And it's not a very fun process necessarily, but it, it is rooted, I believe, ultimately in the people and you know, the top leaders of the company to find the culture and how they work, how they live, what they do every single day. And it's, it, it's, it's really hard to change it. And maybe just to reinforce the point, <laughs> in the earlier stages when the culture is kind of gelling, it's not quite there, really important to be thinking through what you really want to have there in a lasting way, because if you start it, you're going to have to live with it probably yeah. for quite some time. I mean, one of the things I always advise um, founders to do is, like when you're starting the company, write it down. Write down what you want your culture to be. Because if you don't start with that, at least as a goal, <clears throat> it's really hard to figure out how to get there. And you know, we, everyone sets goals around where they want to be around, you know, whether it's user acquisition or sales goals. But starting and literally writing them down, because then everything you, it's OK, Siri. It's totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Sorry. <laughs> Siri, well, what's the, no, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I was gonna do something really bad, I'm not gonna. Anyway, uh, I, I, I actually encourage people to write it down. Now, there's actually two schools of thought about it, which is like if you, if you write it down and you're very public about your cultural goals, uh, there's a school of thought that says, hey, you should never let that happen. You should kind of let it happen organically. I, I'm a big believer you should write it down because like, you should set a target and a goal. Now, the reason why people don't like to write it down is because you know, we've probably all seen or been at companies where they put the cultural values on the back of your like, you know, business card or your badge and, you know, it's like a bunch of BS and you're just like, this is like ridiculous, the stuff that's on the back of this card we don't actually live by. So when you write it down, you have to hold yourself to that. Like you have to live, live that every single day because otherwise it brings a lot of cynicism. But I, I'm a big believer that you gotta write it down and you gotta hold yourself accountable yep. to it. Terrific, Jane. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more about the people side. Um, like, if things aren't working, it's probably because the wrong people are there, or if you need to make a big change, it's going, it's like really hard to change people, especially like the way a group is interacting. What one nuance I'd add is I think um, I would have thought, like, some, it wasn't working in the beginning with our team, and w there was one person in particular. And we were like, if we remove one of four people, if we remove 25% of the team, the morale is going to be horrible, right? So like, what do we do here? And what we didn't recognize was actually like letting someone go is a good indicator when it's not working to the rest of the team. And it can actually help morale because we didn't even see it because it seemed like they were gelling, but it turns out like you can want to have a beer with someone and not want to work with them. Um, and they were looking to us to make a change much sooner than we did. Um, so even if it's not like a whole team flip, even just one, even when it seems like it's working, could, could really change it. I think there are some like explicit stuff that you would write down, um, which we do, and it's a part of the onboarding, et cetera. And then there's these like kind of I don't know, intangibles that, that like, you're like, we should, we should all have drinks on like Wednesday. We should do Wine Wednesdays. So that should be a thing. But it's like not cool to be like, 
Let's have fun on Wednesday. Let's let's all like drink on Wednesday. It's Wednesdays. fun time. Yeah, yeah like, let's go. We're gonna have fun Come right on. now. And it's like, on the calendar. We, we try. We like we. It was like really not cool. Like we like really tried to to do that, and it just didn't work. And we have a, a great advisor, and she was like, "You're like trying too hard. Like chill out." And like just like <laughs> br- just bring out a bottle of wine and just totally. like, and just do it. And so like part of it was. There are the there are the values that you live by and like the cultural has you know like humility and all these things and then there's like we want to have fun and like have this right. kind of an environment and how do you create that and so that you know that organic <laughs> manifestation of that we, we recognized was really important and and now we've kind of gotten to this place with a whole new team um, like you know we all like it just came very organically right. and now we all have drinks together on Fridays. And it's cool, and like everyone like actually yeah. likes it. It's well, that's fun. actually one of the, the one of the hardest things about a CEO was like around culture is. So there's this really funny thing that happened at Gladly. Like, the, there was this thing that was going around in the engineering team called the Golden Mert, which is this brass monkey statue that the team started handing out to each other, like to say thanks. And I was like, that is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Like, <laughs> we're passing around a silly brass monkey. But it like, became this thing in the company. And it was like, hey, every week people say, hey, I'm giving you the golden murk because you did a great job on this thing. And I was like, OK, I wouldn't have passed around a brass monkey. But that's the kind of thing where you kind of like say, hey, that's, that's a really good thing in the end. Like, it wouldn't necessarily be what I would have done. And like, literally, you're like 100 people. And every Friday, we have the golden murk. And someone <laughs> passes it around to the next person. And, and it became this thing that, again, like it happened very organically, and, I, and it's really important to leave room for that kind of stuff. You know, again, I, I got Mert, uh, it became this thing. There's monkey stickers and all over the <laughs> office, and I'm like, they put them on the back of my monitor. I'm like, mm, I'll leave it on there. You know, but like, it wasn't me, but like, okay, it's not, it's not about me at this point. It's about, hey, do we have that you know, very collaborative culture? And it became this thing, and it's great. So. All right, great thoughts, everybody. We have two excellent microphones. So when, when you're uh, ready to say something, we're going to send a microphone your way. And it'd probably be really good if you could introduce yourself by, by name and where you're located. So who would like to get a discussion going? Right here. Don't move. We're going to give you a microphone. It's coming around. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Brianna Bunn. I'm actually a grad of formerly uh, a lawyer of Penn Law. Um, out here in Silicon Valley, I've been running a program called Penn Pack, where I get alumni from Penn, and we do two month strategy consulting projects for local nonprofits. So I've been uh, really connected into the Penn community and met a lot of great people out here. And I'm currently working on my own startup um, around emerging fashion designers. So. My question is for Jane. You said you know you had this one person who didn't work out. And how soon did you realize that? And also, is there something you could do in the future to kind of you know preempt that? Or is it something like you had to you had just have to wait till you hire that person and they're working with you and then go from there? Yeah, it's a great question. I think there was there was the moment we said it out loud and uh, like started to raise question over it. And there's probably a time before that when deep down we knew, um, but maybe didn't want to recognize it. And I think the hardest part with our stage is every role really matters. It's like in the least a body doing work. And that's a really big deal. And it takes forever to hire. So it, it takes a lot to recognize you made a mistake and that you're going to need to go through that hiring process again. So we do a three month trial period where they're not full time yet. Effectively, it's the same thing as far as like the emotional break that you have to make. Um, but it's we've tried to do it to like set expectations of like, look, it might not be the right fit for you and for us. Let's like treat these three months to like feel this out. And so they, there's a natural point where we can talk about it after three months. It's still really, really hard. Um, so we, we recognized it. By the end of those three months, we didn't make a change, or we didn't let her go until five months. Um, and uh, the second part of the question was, did we like, basically did we learn from it, and can we filter for it going forward? And we really are trying to. I don't know if 100% we can filter for it, but um, it's 
it's like dating. Like you date someone, you go through a rough time, and you're like, I'm never gonna let someone do that to me again, or like <laughs> that character flaw. Like I'm gonna be on high alert for that one. Um, and that's basically what it is. I mean, a big, a big part of it became a part of our interview process um, was trying to filter for it, um, and it was like a lot of disagreement in a non-productive way. And so the aspects around um, asking about what you think about failure and then like having someone present and intentionally pushing back and seeing how they react to it all came from that. Um, so we, we really do try to try to look for it now. I mean, the, the biggest thing I think though was like do it sooner. Um, that was uh, Adam Grant, who I'm sure you all know is one of our investors and he was like, we, we were talking to him when we were still in school and we were like, asking for advice, whatever, and he was like, the hardest thing you're gonna face is with the culture, and there's gonna be one bad egg, and you're gonna feel really bad because of all the reasons I've said, and they've been with you from the start, and you're gonna wait too long. And then we went and did it. Um, and so, and it, yeah, you have to feel that pain, I think, to like not do it again. Um, but I don't think it's foolproof. I'm sure we'll continue making yeah. similar mistakes. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, one of my piece of advice to everyone is always, um, when you think that it's time to fire someone, the rest of the company already knows. And, and I remember the first time I had to fire someone, I was like, I can't believe I gotta fire this person. They have like, you know, he's married, he's got two kids, and I'm like, but it was the right thing, it turned out it was the right thing for that person too. Like, you wanna do it with respect and you know, all that kind of stuff, but like, when someone's not working, it is, it is it, like, the impact it has on other people is way worse than you think, actually. So I try to be on the side where people are slightly surprised when I fire somebody now. Like that's my goal. Because if everyone already sort of got to that decision, like they're like looking up at you know, leaders and be like, what is this person doing? Like, th doesn't this person see that this person is not doing a great job? Like why isn't Joseph doing something about it? So I always just like, encourage people like, look, if you think it's not working, you should have a conversation with them, make sure they understand what the expectations are, but put it on a short leash and fire the person. Like you just gotta move on. And what's amazing is I get, I see people that I fired and like they come up to me and they're like, that was the best thing that ever happened to me because you were very clear with me, you told me what was wrong and it helped me to get better in my career actually, which, is, which was like kind of a shocking result. But more importantly, like the people that are there and left, those are the ones you have to care more about as a, I hate to say it, but like the person that you have to let go, so. And by the way, my quick comment on, on the two comments here, culture is a product of big events and statements that are written, and, and I'm, I'm totally into all that, almost by definition. That said, I think a huge driver, without quite appreciating that it is, are the everyday decisions that we make that everybody notice, notices, and they don't actually think necessarily, well, that's a statement about the company, but implicitly yep. it often is. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you an example of that. So um, when I was running, not my current company, previous company I started called Vontu, um, uh, a, 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 a woman who was running marketing at the time, she put, we were do, at this trade show, and she like organized this thing where it was like this roulette wheel and like hired a company to sort of get people to come to the booth or whatever, and they had the typical booth bunny. And I walk up and there's this like slightly scantily clad woman there, but then there's like a line of like literally 100 nerds online to play this game. And I went up to this person and I said, that person's gotta go. And Maureen's like, Joseph, you see the line of people. I'm like, yeah, that's not the company that I want you to work for, and that's not the company that other women in the company work for. I don't care. Like, if that's, like, I don't want to do that. And she was like, like, it like dramatically changed like her perspective about like how much she loved the company at that point. Because she was like, I can't believe you're willing to let the hundred nerds go away because you don't think that that's the right statement to make about the company. And like, like, and then that story, by the way, I found out later, like was told over and over and over to every single woman that joined the company. And it was like, and it was just, it just was like a gut reaction of like, I, that's, I do not want to be at that kind of company. And, and I appreciated their creativity, but it wasn't, it wasn't, hmm. it just wasn't right. Super, thanks. Floor is open right over here. Hi, my name is Leo. I'm a 2006 graduate of the MNT program undergrad. 
I'm currently at a healthcare club, a healthcare startup called Collective Health. Um, we actually also have a very treasure culture. We have things called Golden Greg for the company. Um, our customer service team has the Golden Headset. Being product team, we have the Golden Wrench. Um, something we treasure very much. I get exactly what you're talking about. Um, rather than firing, my question is about the hiring front. Um, so we're now in the hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, and as you interview, as you bring people on, there's this temptation. You're like, this guy's. He can definitely do his job. He can definitely, the technical competency is there. And there's that voice in the back of your head. You're like, culturally, he's, you know, something's off, right? Um, and then there's that temptation, like, I need this person yesterday <laughs> to do the job because we were growing that much. And I'm probably unconscious bias somehow anyways when I don't, like, what I, my brain's telling me is culture misfit. I may be having unconscious bias, which I also don't want. And how do you fight that temptation? And how do you know which, when to go which way? And then later on, they're here, right? And then you realize, oh, this person's not the yeah. culturally there. And then what do you do then? Yeah. Uh, so I will say, actually, that the, uh, your gut instinct on hiring is actually oftentimes right. And that you should never, ever make a hiring decision because you're like, shoot, we need someone in the, in, the, in the seat. Like, that's the worst decision, actually, ever because that usually results in a bad hire, and that sets you back even more. Meaning that um, you know, if, you hire, if you hire the wrong person for the job, it's a worse impact than not having anyone in the job, I found. I, I mean, because you end up then having the, you know, the person's there, they cause all kinds of negative con issues, and then you end up having to replace them anyway. And if you just waited, you probably would have hired the right person in that comparative time period. Um, but it's super hard, and I think, that, I think the thing that we always say is like, you're never gonna be 100% right in hiring. And you just have to, like, it's one of those things you just have to go into it knowing that you're going to make mistakes, just fix them quickly. So you want to hire as slow as you can, but you just want to fire as quickly as you can. And I think that that's one of the lessons that I've learned about the importance of around people is it's not just about, hey, we've got to get great people, et cetera, but you got to get rid of those people that if you do make a mistake, fix it quickly. Um, because it, 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 it becomes a, a cancer, um, so. Jane. I, I would say culture is almost more important than the capability of the job, which I know sounds crazy, and I would have never said that before. But the negative impact of culture can, can like really destroy value in the company more than I could have ever imagined. Um, so we optimize more for culture fit. You know, there's a threshold. They still have to pass, like, there's a project for every functional role. Um, but the culture now trumps, like, if, the, if one excels, you know, more above the threshold, but the other is a better culture fit, we, we try to strive for um, that culture fit. I couldn't agree more on we, we let this person go right before our seed round, and it was the growth marketing role, like the person running growth for our company at a time when we were raising against how big of a company we were growing and how fast we were growing. Um, and we waited five months hiring really slowly for the role. And I don't think I would have ever said it. There were a lot of low moments, um, like really low. But I'm so happy we waited and have the right person in, because I couldn't agree more. It sets you back um, in all, all different ways. But um, yeah, I mean, it really, like that sounds pretty. But I totally get the realities of like, you got to get the job done, and we're kind of we're we're questioning one person on the team right now, and like we're about to go into A, um, and like do we just buckle down? And I think the the filter we're going through now is the culture one. She actually is a great culture fit, and there's some like it's basically going to take some micromanaging to make sure the job gets done. And it's like okay, heads down, micromanage a bit, spend more hours through to the A, and get through that, um, and then see where we're at, at after that point. Great questions, by the way. I think we've got time for one more right over here. Thanks, Irina. Uh, my name is Basa. Uh, this is my seventh um, scale school attendee. And I actually, more than that, I'm probably one of the only or few um, college <laughs> um, attendees. Um, ooh, wow, that's terrible. But um, <laughs> College of 91, um, undergrad architecture. So um, and uh, what, so, I'm co-founder and CEO of a company called Uplift Labs. Uh, we are a seed stage uh, startup. My first zero to one. We're trying to democratize the ability for everybody in the world to be able to move a little better. Um, and you can see more on our website. So 
A lot of my background has actually been trying to scale organizations in large companies from Apple to Tesla, and most recently, my zero to one. Since this is about scale school, my question is that in terms of the culture infusion, it's kind of, you know, and this is a question for all three of you, really. It's one thing to uh, be able to express a value system or a culture, but oftentimes when you're you know, hiring massively and growing, you're bringing people from and mid-hire level, uh, people from other cultures, and also you tend to get referrals, right? People that your VP of engineer used to work with this person, used to work with that person. How do you actually go about effectively to instill your cultural values rather than kind of get overwhelmed with the different type of large subset of groups that are coming in that are bringing their, you know, maybe sharp elbowed cultures from you know, companies in Seattle, per se, or, you know, other places. Right. So I'm a little biased coming from Apple. But. Great question. So besides giving them a culture pill, <laughs> Jane, what's your method? Um, I, I think in situations like that, it's about how you act in a moment where it's against the culture. Um, granted, we are not scaled, and you will have better thoughts on, like, the scaling, but um, you can only say so much that, like, this is a culture where we empower each other um, as a team, and we don't take ourselves too seriously, and all these things. And then a moment hits where it's against those values or the culture, and it's how you act in that moment, which, which you were talking to as well. Um, and people look to you in that moment. Like There have been moments where um, a potential investor has said something that's against our values, um, and I've, you know, we've, we've said something. Um, and I don't think we recognized in the moment that people were looking to us, but later it came up, um, or someone on the team has said or done something, and, and there have been moments where we haven't said something, and it's come up like in a negative way. They haven't said, you, never, you didn't say anything, but we didn't, we didn't even notice the moment, and then they'll call it out later, and so we've started to recognize how important it is to, to take those actions like in the moment when, when it's against Great the culture. Point. I think for us, the, the thing that we've always tried to do is um, it, it all goes back to the hiring process. And um, most companies actually don't invest a lot in their team's uh, competency of recruiting. And what I mean by that is we've probably all been in interviews, like, like you have a slate of interviews with like four people, and they all four ask you the same exact stupid questions. Like literally, it's like, so tell me about your background. It's like you have my LinkedIn or my resume right in front of you. Why are you asking me that question? So what we try to do is we really invest in the whole process of understanding what it is that we're recruiting for. We're very deliberate about it. And we're, we're very um, focused on both the functional competency, but also the, what I call the relational competency or the cultural values. And we have like a whole set of questions that we interview on. And we have a process where there's a feedback loop through the interview cycle where you know, this person is going to ask certain questions about like growth mindset. And if they didn't feel good about it, they literally take five minutes before the next interview and like, okay, so here's the things the person said, I didn't like this and this and this, so really dig in on this and make sure you're getting at it. So really trying to like get that process. But we also invest a lot in training the team how to do interviews. Because most people have never been trained. It's not actually a class you take at school. So getting people the skills of how to ask the right questions, how to ask the right follow-up questions, how to get to the details versus the superficial, like investing in that as you're scaling is so important because you know, when you have 100 and you're going to 1,000, okay, you're going to you know, have that 10x growth. You have to rely on the, on, on the team to do that stuff that you did when you hired the first 10. It's the same thing. You've got to figure out how the stuff that you did when you were doing the first 10, how you've got to teach them how they're going to do that, you know, they're all going to hire 10 or 20 or 100 people. So investing in that training of the team, how to do interviewing, I think is really, really important. All right, Joseph and Jane, a final question, and we're going to sum up. And I'd like you all to be thinking about your summary points. Two-sided question here, culture, the culture of purpose. I think we all want purpose. It's kind of an obvious statement there. And cultures can get pretty good or just the opposite in identifying why the heck you're working so hard. Well, what is the purpose? Who are we serving? So the question is, how do you help create a, a culture of purpose? And then on the negative side, this is culture as crime prevention. How do you create a culture of integrity so people stay above the line? Joseph, want to start? Um, 
The culture of integrity, I think, is, um, is primarily from your actions. So like that story I told about you know, the trade show is, is one example. And um, um, it, it, so when you make some statements like that about people, like, and it's that moment where you've got some sort of uh, question on your integrity, don't pause. Go as fast as you can to make the right decision. You know, um, if someone does something which is just inexcusable, don't don't think about it. I don't care if the person's a rock star; they're out. And making a statement about the stuff that is not acceptable and making it very uh, public and making it very clear, um, you know, sends a statement. You know, when you start to have that little gray line, which is like, okay, well, we'll just sort of let that slide. It is absolutely a slippery slope. So. Um, you know, there's just certain things where you just like there is no tolerance for certain things, and you have to make sure people understand that. So, and it's from your your actions; it's not just your statements. Um, in terms of a culture of purpose, um, I, I think the key thing is actually finding people who believe what you believe. So, being clear about what you believe, and being able to articulate what you believe, is like step one. And then you have to go find people who believe what you believe. Because you can't necessarily always convince people to believe what you believe. But if you find people that do believe it already, that, that mission, if you will, um, then, then like, you, you have to go, you, you, know, you seek them out. And, it, and it's not just your internally, it's with your partners, your customers, et cetera. So I just, I, I, I think that getting at that question of you have to understand what it is, and you got to make sure that the people that you bring on believe it. Because it's very clear when they don't. And, um, and it's, it's just a total impedance mismatch, and it doesn't work out. So be clear about what it is and interview for it. Jane. Um, I mean, for purpose, I mean, that's, that's such a like, fundamental thing within the brand, within the business, that I think you have to be really clear about what your purpose is, because it's only, it, ha it has to come, come from you. And so that became very, cl we, we decided that when we were in school, probably soon after we decided we had the same value or found out we had the same values. And we were like, why are we really doing this? Why are we going against every reason we came to Wharton right now and taking this enormous risk while our friends are going back to McKinsey and Bain, <laughs> wherever else? Um, you know, and what is this really about to us? Is it about selling a ton of bras? Uh, that, that has never been a dream of either of ours. That feels weird. And what it like ultimately came down to was this probably sounds cliche, but it was, this, it was this broader purpose of we want to empower women. Like, we freaking hate bra shopping, and our friends are these unbelievably successful doctors, lawyers, business women who are wearing $1,000 suits and a torn, ripped bra in a world where it's cool to buy razor blades and mattresses online. That's effed up. Like, we are, we are trying to empower these women in a, in, to just get their basic commodity, right? Like, and what is holding them back to the point where, like, literally there's an underwire poking them in the side in the middle of a board meeting? And it was, okay, how can we help empower these women? And then we stepped back, and this was, like, over a bottle of wine in Sri Lanka when we visited our factory for the first time to make sure they were empowering their women who worked there that make up 80% of their workforce. Um, and it was like, OK, if, if we could really think big, we're empowering our friends, our family who are working today. But what about the next generation of women? Like, wh how could we really like, make sure they're there? And I don't, I don't think we could have ever imagined the, how pertinent that statement would be three years later, um, nor would we have ever wished it. But it, it is very important in this moment in time. And it's important to our customers as well. Um, but that, that's when it was, OK, let's, let's find a way to give back to girls' education. We, we started to educate ourselves a bit more, and we understood that girls were, had way less access to education than boys all over the world. Um, and we started to understand from the very start they weren't set up for success. Um, and so we tried to find a way to still build a company that would be profitable and could because otherwise it's kind of a moot point to give back. Um, but that became our bigger purpose. And we always knew that it mattered to the two of us, but it probably wouldn't sell bras. And that we were totally fine with that. And it would probably turn some investors off. And we were totally fine with that. Um, but for the people who we brought in, it was really important to them. And they, they find that 
bigger purpose, I think. There's also like the tactical day-to-day, -day, like yes, they believe in this brand, they wanna, we call, we say lift up the ladies, lifting up your ladies in the future generation. We do a lot of bra puns. Um, so they like, they really believe in that, but then there's the day-to-day, -day, right? And we're like packing bras and all this stuff. And so I think we, we get down to like very tactical as well by giving people individual metrics they can hit. So they understand, and we define how their metric can contributes to the broader business metric that we report on quarterly. We have weekly all hands. So it's very clear what their purpose is in the company, too. Um, so defined a bit differently and less like cliche, big, we're going to save the world and empower women. One. Super. Thank you, Annette. Uh, we're going to uh, begin to bring this to a close in, in three separate ways on your part. I'd like you to be thinking of a, a main point from the great commentary we've had that you somehow would find useful in the months ahead. Number two, as we walk out of here, I'd like you to turn to one of the people you just met and tell them what your thinking is and hear their thinking out. And then finally, uh, hold off an applause for just a second. The three of us are going to stand down here at this door. Would you mind leaving this way? Uh, it's our way of thanking you for being here, and it's your way of thanking our two guests for commentary tonight. And let's close it down this way. Jane, I'm going to begin with you. Just a final thought on the power of leadership and culture to make a difference. Oh, no pressure. Um, I mean, I, I think the biggest, when I was like reflecting on some of the questions you sent us, um, I, like prior to Wharton, I was at McKinsey and I defined leadership in one way or on one dimension and it was leading others, it was leading teams, it might be managing the people below you, it might be managing up, but it was like this defined in this one way and I think I've started to recognize there are, at least for the two of us, two other really important dimensions to it. The first of which is like how you even define your leadership roles. I, I didn't even recognize how hard and how important that was because it was just table stakes at McKinsey, a manager does this, a principal does this, whatever. And you know, we had to define our roles and how we act to our teams. So that was really big. And then I think the most important one was leading externally. Um, so these moments of truth in a scenario like that where you said something with that woman, um, a moment when, you know, when in, a potent, in an investor meeting someone says something, how, how we lead and how we, you know, shut down an inappropriate comment or something, um, to, even, to even leading, you know, we've been fortunate enough to have been guided by some founders ahead of us on how to fundraise to the point where it significantly changed the course of our business. And we understand we have the need to pass that along to, to other female founders as well to help them. Um, so that's, that's like, I think, if I think about my two different worlds, pre-Wharton, post-Wharton, that's kind of been, it's opened my eyes to this bigger picture of what leadership is and how, how it can really, and that obviously affects the culture in the way that we've shared in the last hour. Great, thank you. Joseph? I think for me, the thing that I always try to keep in mind is this idea that the people that follow you, because leaders at the, we were talking about earlier, like it's a leader is someone with followers. Your team, if you believe that every single day they're making a decision whether or not to follow you, that helps to set how you act every single day. And just reminding yourself of that, that people have a lot of choices about what they can do, where they can be, what companies they can go to. And you know, when I wake up every day, I'm like, OK, you know, what, what is the thing that we're going to do today that's going to make sure that you know, the 100 people now gladly, let's say, are going to continue to follow us? Because you know, the journey, especially in a startup, is it's really hard. Um, you know, most, most startups do fail. And most of them face some sort of existential threat. And um, if, if, you can, if you can get people, again, to, to use that phrase, who believe what you believe and see you acting on that belief in the right way all the time and knowing that they're making that decision every single day, um, it, just keeps you, it just keeps that guiding principle and that sort of that guiding light and the, and the North Star of, OK, what do we need to be doing so that every single day people say, yeah, I still want to come to do this mission that we're on. And um, um, it's, a, it's a simple thought, but it's really hard to live every single day. So. Awesome. Let me offer a, a quick uh, summary line as follows. Something to the effect of uh, strategy and leadership and culture. We need to know where we're going before we can go anywhere. Call that the strategy piece. But to get there, we've got to execute around that strategy. 
But for more than five or ten people, it is amazing how important it is to build a world around us, a mindset that makes a difference. So with that, we're going to have a de-receiving line right over here. So if you wouldn't mind exiting this way, we're going to thank them there. But would you join me now in thanking Jane and Jessica? Hi, right, everybody. Uh, sorry, Carl. No, I won't, I won't gild the lily here. Awesome job. Thanks, everyone, for making the time. And let's thank our, our panelists and Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.